Hi. Um, happy Wednesday, everybody. Let me get my PowerPoint up here. There we go. Okay, so speaking on uh, Lyme disease today, it's a uh, title, obviously, is you can read an integrative approach to acute and chronic Lyme disease. So typically when you think of Lyme, you know, people think of, you get a tick bite, you get a bullseye rash, and then you take some antibiotics and you're fine. Friends that are you sharing your screen yet? Oh, we, uh, nope. I'm not seeing it. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's just grab that here. Um, okay. Can you guys see that? Okay. Yeah, we got um, it. Thank you. Sure. So um, when you think about Lyme disease, you think about getting a tick bite and, you know, having a bullseye rash, and then, you know, either you get antibiotics or you get sick and then you get antibiotics. But um, there are a lot of misconceptions about Lyme. Um, so we'll go through some of the, the highlights. Um, so right here, I put a, a timeline of um, Lyme disease. They used to think that um, Lyme was generated or discovered right around 1975 in Lyme, Connecticut, um, when a lot of kids were being diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, but it turns out that um, the Yale School of Public Health has found that Lyme disease began in North America around 60,000 years ago, maybe more. Um, so essentially as the deforestation continued, you know, Lyme disease became more prevalent, um, back then, obviously humans weren't even around. So they, it's been working through deer and foxes and all kinds of other vectors that I'll go over in a little while. Um, so here I noted that the, uh, explosion of deer in the 20th century, um, into suburban landscapes are, it, it basically made them prime carriers for ticks. Uh, there was no natural predators like wolves, um, hunting restrictions came about and ticks, you know, now, I mean, uh, deer are now like an invasive species in a lot of parts. Um, deer ticks are the primary culprit for uh, transmission of Lyme disease. So, New England and the Midwest is where the bulk of um, Borrelia burgdorferi is um, isolated to, but they're finding all kinds of different species in all different parts of the world and, and in all different parts of the country, um, not just isolated to those areas. So climate change, um, making you know warmer winters are going to accelerate the ticks life cycles and, and they can... Um, survive an estimated 28 miles further north each year. So in the winter time, a lot of times, you know, they're killed off when the, the temperatures get below 32, but it's, um, it's becoming more prevalent in areas that, you know, like up in um, New England and Canada. So it's the most common vector-borne disease in North America. That means that there's, um, you know, a transmission like an arthropod, uh, such as spiders or um, ticks or mosquitoes or fleas um, and mites. So most people think they just come from that one type of deer tick, and that's that's not true. Um, in the Midwest and Eastern U.S., the ex exodes, scapularis, or the deer ticks, the primary vector of Lyme disease, but um, there have been dog ticks that can transmit um, Babesia and all kinds of other infections, which we'll go over later. On the West Coast, the spirochete, um, the Lyme spirochete, that's the type of bacteria that it is, is called, is carried by Ixodes pacificus or the Western black leg, black leg tick. In the South, um, Lone Star ticks can also transmit Lyme um, or they can transmit um, Starry, which is um, Southern tick associated rash illness. Um, so I've listed here all of the types, the um, species of Borrelia that are around. There may even be more, but um, like the Borrelia zeli is from Europe. Um, and so is the Guarini. 
And then um, Borrelia mayoni is was discovered in only in 2016 in the Midwest. So a lot of labs can't even keep up with the testing for these because they're only um, really geared towards the Borrelia burgdorferi. So I don't know if you guys can see if this bar is in the way. Okay, what are the vectors for Lyme? So like I said before, it's not just ticks. You've got uh, the deer tick, which can carry any of these, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, ehrlichiosis, Lyme disease, Borrelia, Miyamotoi disease, and Powassan virus disease. Um, dog ticks as well. Um, soft ticks, which is a different kind of tick than any of the, the ones that you've probably um, realized were ticks. And fleas, like I said, the Western black-legged tick, um, it can be passed transplacentally from uh, mother to baby. They think that it could be passed um, through sexual activity. Uh, blood transfusions has been known to spread um, Lyme and um, it's also Borrelia species has actually been found in spiders, mosquitoes, and horse flies. Although if you ask the CDC, that's not a, a vector, but I, I don't think that's true. Um, squirrels, lizards, mice, vole, foxes, coyote, deer. Um, these are all common hosts for the Western black leg tick and, um, birds, migrating birds can act as a long distance transporter, which is why you'll see a lot of different types of ticks all over the, the country. Um, so, so some of the things I mentioned before, like anaplasmosis, Bartonella, Ehrlichia, Kitsiosis, Babesia, those are the most common co-infections. So co-infections are things that the ticks can carry and transmit along with Lyme. Sometimes you'll get any of these infections alone, or sometimes you'll get a lot of them together, or maybe just one and, and Lyme. Um, but these others here, Powassan fever, bourbon virus, Morgellons disease, Starry, Heartland virus, alpha-gal syndrome, tick-borne relapsing fever, and Colorado fever, those can also come from um, various types of ticks. So uh, I'll go over some of the symptoms of these things later, but um, one that I don't know if I have listed later is alpha-gal syndrome, and that can come from the Lone Star tick and it causes beef allergies. It's kind of strange. Um, it also has other symptoms along with it, like fatigue and rashes, but that's the primary uh, hallmark of it. So these are transmitted through the same tick bite uh, that can cause Lyme disease. They can either cause symptoms themselves or they can exacerbate symptoms of Lyme um, and then add to the symptoms as well. Um, they make it more difficult to treat the Lyme because you know you kind of have to start peeling back layers. A lot of these um, you can actually treat with doxycycline just like you can Lyme, but that you have to make sure that you do an adequate course and usually people are giving you know two weeks, maybe a month. And um, I think that for prophylaxis to make sure it doesn't turn into chronic Lyme, you need at least two. But you have to make sure that you're doing things to protect the gut and when you're killing off all these uh, good flora in addition to the, the bacteria. Um, Babesia is the only one of these that is actually a parasite. And Anaplasma, Bartonella, Ehrlichia, and Rickettsia are all um, bacteria. And then these, the bourbon virus is caused by virus, clearly. Morgellons disease is kind of a strange one. Um, they, a lot of medical doctors do not think this is actually, uh, has a cause. They think it's a psychiatric illness. Um, we'll go through all that later. But um, some of these I listed down here, mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, Epstein-Barr virus, candida, and mycotoxins. They're often found in patients with Lyme because the... Um, person either has a weakened immune system and these are opportunistic infections, or it's just that um, they may have had these things before and that weakened their immune system. And then when they got Lyme, it was kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back. But you have to, it, a lot of times when you're treating Lyme, you don't just treat Lyme. You have to treat everything else that's keeping the immune system from doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so here I wrote down some different types of ticks that carry different things. So Exodes ticks carry Lyme, Ehrlichia, Bartonella, Anaplasma, and Babesia. Um, fleas can also carry Bartonella 
And um, you can also get that type of bacteria from uh, cat scratch, it's called cat scratch fever. Um, Lone star tick causes, uh, like I said, the um, southern tick associated illness, and then um, it can cause Ehrlichia as well. And then ticks, mites, fleas, or lice can cause rickettsiosis. And um, people with a G6PD deficiency are more susceptible to serious illness from rickettsia species. Um, and then Babesia and Lyme can be passed transposomally or through blood transfusions, which I mentioned before. So here are some differences in symptoms of co-infections versus just straight Lyme disease. So with Lyme, you get the localized erythema migrans or the bullseye rash at the site of the tick bite. Um, I would say that happens in maybe 10% of cases. And that's 10% of known cases that the CDC recognizes. Um, that's probably maybe a quarter of the actual cases of Lyme that, that are out there. Um, fatigue, headaches, joint pain, muscle pain, multiple organ function impairment. Basically, Lyme just attacks wherever there's a weakness in the first place. Um, brain fog, I didn't write on your memory issues. You can develop allergies, um, endocrine disruption, so it can disrupt the hormones. And so again, you can treat the Lyme, but then once the Lyme is broken something, you have to fix that too. Sometimes you can treat the Lyme um, and everything else sort of falls into place, but most people feel better when you kind of treat the whole person instead of just the Lyme disease. So Bartonella, one of, there's a couple of hallmarks with that. Um, regional lymphadenopathy, meaning like hardened swelling in the lymph nodes, especially in the neck, um, can be caused by a cat scratch or bite, but again, it can be caused by a tick as well. You normally get that lymphadenopathy or that those uh, kind of similar to Lyme, how that has the, the bullseye rash, you know, when somebody with a really strong immune system response, um, you'll get that in Bartonella um, with people who have strong immune responses or if it's from a cat, you know, when it's a direct transmission. Um, striations resembling stretch marks on the abdomen. So they, they're they like purple kind of wavy lines um, that, that do look an awful lot like stretch marks. But um, you, if I see them in children, obviously, especially thinner children, I always think Bartonella. Headaches are big. Um, with Bartonella. Muscle aches are really big with Bartonella. Um, infections of the eye, liver, spleen, brain, bones, and um, it can cause endocarditis and fatigue. So let's see, with Babesia, there's a bunch of symptoms here too that this one's uh, particularly annoying to get rid of, but it causes fatigue, anorexia, or loss of appetite. Um, Myalgia, which is muscle pain, joint pain, nausea, depression, dark urine, um, anxiety, shortness of breath, um, kind of like air hunger, like not just I can't breathe, but you feel like <laughs> um, night sweats, generalized sweating, chills, cough, fever, neck stiffness, pallor, or pale skin, emotional lability, um, jaundice, and hemolytic anemia. So it destroys uh, red blood cells. So can you guys see these labels? Um, so rickettsia, one of the other common ones, or it can cause, um, there's a lot of different species of rickettsia, like too many to name, and each one causes a different presentation. But um, rickettsia, rickettsia causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, which is probably the most common. There's a lot of different types as well, but I'll go over all those later. Um, so rickettsia can cause a rash that occurs two or four days after the onset of a fever, um, headaches, fevers, gas, gastrointestinal symptoms, um, abdominal pain. So if you, if you're noticing all of these have overlapping symptoms, um, and so there's, there are harm marks with each one, but they're very similar. So it's kind of, you have to test for all of them usually. Myalgia or muscle pain, same with Bartonella and Babesia and Lyme. Um, swollen lymph nodes here too, different, not as hard as the, the ones that you see in Bartonella. Um, you get a sore with a black scab a lot of times. And this is all if you're lucky. Like if you see the the bullseye rash and you see the black, the sore with the black scab and you see the, um, you know, the swelling in the neck, 
um, those at least give you a chance to treat it pretty quickly. So there's a chance of eradication, but most people, either their immune system doesn't recognize it, it's, you know, too messed up with other stuff, or, you know, it just, the Lyme or these things hide. So um, a lot of cases end up being chronic, which is not the end of the world because you just have to do a maintenance protocol, which we'll talk about, but um, it's a lot of them are very stealthy infections. So if you get a severe Rocky Mountain spotted fever um, presentation, you can have altered men mental status, coma, and cerebral edema. That's pretty, pretty uh, uh, extreme. I, I haven't really seen that. So um, respiratory compromise, um, meaning you're hard to breathe, some pulmonary edema and acute respiratory distress syndrome, skin um, and soft tissue necrosis, which can result in amputations or skin grafts. Again, the, these are usually in areas where you know, there's no treatment available or it's just a particularly uh, extreme case. And then multiple multi-organ system damage, the central nervous system and kidney failure. So ehrlichiosis, um, moderate fever, chills, headaches, you can read all these, uh, confusion and cognitive impairment is a big one. And then they also have rashes. So not all of these do generate a rash like anaplasmosis does not. Um, and it also, anaplasmosis also does not cause, uh, the confusion or cognitive impairment, generally speaking. Anaplasmosis is actually the most common, um, co-infection with Lyme and rarely tested for just because it doesn't have any hallmark features. So if you see like moderate fever, chills, headaches, muscle pain, general malaise, joint pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite, all those kind of overlap with Ehrlichia and um, Rickettsia and Lyme and Bartonella and Babesia. So here are some of the less prevalent co-infections that you may or may not have heard of. We'll go back. There we go. Um, Heartland and bourbon viruses, those are new. They recent, were recently discovered. Um, I don't know if they'll have data, you know, in the, in the future that shows that it's been around forever, but from what I know, it's, it's been recently discovered. There are no tests for them, um, except for there's a lab called MDL labs and they run pretty much all of the, the panels you could imagine. Um, it's spread by the Lone Star Tick and they're, it's found primarily in Tennessee and Missouri. Um, People with bourbon virus have symptoms including fever, tiredness, rash, headache, other body aches, nausea, vomiting, and low blood cell counts. Um, and those are the cells that fight infection and help prevent bleeding, so clotting um, cells. Powassan fever is a viral infection as well. Um, it says online that, uh, like on the PubMed articles that half the patients contracting this disease will have permanent neurological damage. I don't think that's going to be necessarily true once they have adequate testing for it and more people are diagnosed. I think it'll be kind of like Lyme where people can go for 10, 15 years without realizing that they have it. Um, and it doesn't necessarily cause permanent damage, but you know, something always like either stress or, um, you know, some kind of a, another illness, pregnancy, things like that can often alert people to the existence of Lyme because it, it takes so much out of your body that when you're holding on by a thread, you can't do it anymore. So it's like a straw that broke the camel's back. Um, so <clears throat> with pals and fever, it causes um, brain and spinal cord inf inflammation, severe headaches, stiff neck, and seizures, and then all the other symptoms that are caused by Lyme. So um, it's really hard to treat it. So I, I typically like with a virus, I will do something like andrographis, um, herb, or maybe, you know, valcyclovir or something related to that. But I, I have not actually encountered Powassan fever myself. So I'm going to be looking out for it. Um, now that I am privy to that information, um, Again, it says it's still relatively rare with fewer than hundred cases reported to the CDC since 2004. But I think that there's gonna be more out there once the testing is adequate again. So once the tick attaches, it, this particular um, illness can be transmitted in as little as 15 minutes. So, you know, even if you don't think that the tick's been embedded really, it, you can have something um, pretty quick. So, 
starry causes generalized fatigue, headaches, stiff neck, and occasionally fever. And then Morgellons was what I was talking about earlier. It's a emerging disease that causes really strange symptoms. Basically people feel like there's fibers coming out of their skin. Um, and then they scratch and they try to get them out. And so a lot of times they have a sensation of something crawling under their skin. So doctors will mistake them for drug addicts or paranoid schizophrenics, or, you know, just people that have psychiatric problems in general, because when doctors go to sample that region of the skin, there's nothing that they find. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're like, they'll do antiparasitic or they'll do parasitic testing and they'll do, you know, tests for things like, um, other dermatological Ill illnesses like fungus and things like that. But I think that they, they just haven't isolated a, the test for this particular thing. I think that there is probably some Lyme involvement there because a lot of people that I've, that have had more gentlemen that I've tested for Lyme have been positive. So here are some opportunistic infections that often come along with Lyme, um, which I will test for usually if I suspect Lyme. Um, because they either exacerbate the treatment of Lyme or the Lyme can make it so that the body can't fight these things off. Uh, mycoplasma pneumonia and chlamydia pneumonia are both bacteria that can cause sinus infections, respiratory infections. Um, and they are, this one in particular is intracellular. Um, so that means it can actually embed itself in the DNA of the cell. And it can be hard to eradicate. It can, you know, predispose people to cancer. It can, um, cause chronic sinus infections, and it can make um, headaches and things more prevalent. Um, chlamydia pneumonia actually has been uh, shown to have a, a um, correlation with uh, pelvic inflammatory disease and um, PCOS. So candida um, is a yeast that naturally occurs in our gut, but not all people have it. Most people have it, some species of it. And it is a fung in the fungal family and it can cause sugar cravings. It can cause irritability, brain fog, memory issues, um, acne, uh, fungus in the nails, um, oral fungus. So like white tongue coating. Um, it's, it's really a hard, hard thing to get rid of, honestly, but you know, if you're diligent about it and eliminate sugar and, and, um, you do some antifungal medications and then follow up with herbs, it's, I can get rid of it. Um, parasites are also often found with, uh, Lyme patients. Um, they can actually cause, um, the, like the majority of the symptoms, um, but they're very hard to test for. So people often, you know, don't want to take a medication for something that they may or may not have. Um, and doctors often don't want to prescribe a medication for something that we don't know if they have. So that one's a pretty stealthy invader and it's, it's pretty hard to, to identify. Heavy metal toxicity, um, that can really exacerbate Lyme disease as well. And a lot of people who have issues with clearing or detoxifying the body, um, they will have a hard time fighting Lyme and then they'll have a hard time clearing metals too. Uh, mycotoxin illness. And again, like if you have any of these one, two, all of them, it's, it's going to be more and more and more that your body has to deal with. So, you know, if you get Lyme or you get candida and you have all the other things, then it, that may not be the thing that's the worst, but it might be again, the straw that broke the camel's back. I kind of uh, have an analogy where you take a coffee cup and you fill it up a little bit, you know, EBV, mycoplasma, Lyme, candida, parasites, and, you know, each little thing might be a small contributing factor, um, hair products that you use, body lotions, but then eventually, you know, the cup can't hold it anymore and it just starts mixing up and, and spilling over. So kind of have to start peeling back the layers and, and take care of all these things to really achieve, you know, full um, improvement. So mycotoxin illness, um, that one, again, that's a lot of people will develop allergies because of these co-infections. And then if they develop allergies to mold and they're being exposed to mold, um, it's, it's worse. So you can calm down the allergic response while binding up some of these mycotoxins and, and the biotoxins that the Lyme and these other co-infections emit when you kill them. And then your body feels a lot less of a toxic burden and your, your symptoms, you know, seemingly go away. 
So some of the testing options, um, got a couple of, I pretty much just mixed them up because, and I can tell you which ones are conventional, which ones are integrated. MDL labs, uh, a lot more MDs are starting to order this, but this is started as an integrative, you know, more alternative lab. Um, this one will run basically every type of Borrelia or Lyme um, species. It will run the, I think the Palisan fever. Um, it does bourbon fever, I believe. Uh, it does all the Babesias, all the Bartonellas. Um, uh, I think it might do Epstein-Barr virus as well. I mean, basically that's that's probably the most thorough one that they have. IgenX is a really great one for uh, identifying Babesia and identifying Lyme. Um, and although it does offer other things as well, they have a full panel, Lyme and co-infection panel. Um, I believe that for the full panel, MDL labs is cheaper, uh, but if you just did like a more sensitive IgM, an IgG, IgenX, uh, that one's I think only about two to $300. So the C6 peptide ELISA test um, is one of the more favored tests in conventional medicine. Um, I rarely see it come up positive, but um, you know, a lot of that's the gold standard in, you know, these days for the initial testing. Um, Vibrant Wellness is another company. Everly Well is another company. I have not used Everly Well uh, for Lyme testing. I've seen it, but I, I don't order it. I guess I could, but I don't. Um, Vibrant Wellness people like, that's a good one. Uh, Stony Point is a little more traditional. Um, they'll do like the C6 peptide. They'll do the Lyme Western blot. And they'll do the PCR uh, reaction for Lyme as well. Galaxy Diagnosis is the preferred um, company for Bartonella, although MDL Labs will sometimes pick it up. And so will IGNX, not all the time though. Um, these are some of the things that we can order through Quest or LabCorp or you know, Boston Labs or anything, you know, the normal ones, the traditional ones. TNF Alpha, um, that one often goes up when there's inflammation related to Lyme and, and the co-infections. CD57 will tell you um, how your immune system is doing in relation to fighting Lyme. So if you're looking for a number, if you're treating, uh, you want the number to be over 120 before you consider it you know, fully eradicated. Um, if it's under 60, then it's considered very low. Um, Normally, if a person doesn't have Lyme, it'll be somewhere between, you know, 60 and 300, but 120 is about, let's say it's the goal for uh, people who have Lyme. The Lyme Western blot, a lot of times you'll run this with, or I'll run this with um, Quest or LabCorp and they, it will come back with maybe one or two bands that are positive. So they have IgG bands and they test for, I believe, nine of them. And then they have three IgM, which is the more acute active infection. Um, they have three bands for that. The CDC wants either five bands for IgG or two out of three bands for the IgM to be positive in order to consider it a positive diagnosis. Um, a lot of times I'll see like a band 41 come up and that one cross reacts with Epstein-Barr virus. So if you have Epstein-Barr virus, a lot of times it can cause that particular band to show up positive. But if you treat the Epstein-Barr virus for a while, maybe like a month or even two weeks, and then you retest the Western blot and more bands come out that are you know more specific for Lyme, then you know that it's, yes, you have Epstein-Barr more than likely, but you also have Lyme. Um, a lot of people who have Lyme, their immune system is so weakened that they can't even recognize the parts of Lyme that are tested for. So they don't have anything to show up on the blood. So as you strengthen the immune system, you know, there, I've, I did have one patient that I had, I treated her, I, she was my patient for five years. And I kept saying, I think you have Lyme. We tested this Western blot maybe 10 times. Um, but we just kept chipping away at, you know, the allergies that she had and we worked on boosting her immune system and just, you know, built her up like a, a holistic approach. And then sure enough, um, after her immune system healed and started functioning more optimally, she, she, she came up with a full positive CDC criteria met Lyme Western blood. So, um, you know, I, I take those with a grain of salt. 
but you can, I, I've been doing it long enough where I can tell by symptoms by a person's energy almost. And, um, you know, by some of the other, uh, concomitant illnesses that come along with it, whether or not they have Lyme. Um, WA1 is a test for Babesia and it's the, it's the WA stands for Washington state. So there's a particular type of Babesia that is unique to that area. Um, theoretically. And that one has a special test, but then they also have IgG and IgM for, for Bartonella, for Babesia, for Lichia, for Rickettsia. And then they have a Rickettsial fever panel at uh, most of those labs that will also test for Q, Q fever and um, typhus and, you know, other Rickettsial related illnesses. So some conventional treatment approaches. Um, Doxycycline is like the gold standard for treatment, especially if you are getting somebody that has recently had a tick bite um, and you want to use it prophylactically. It does tear up your stomach. Um, it does cause like a sun poisoning reaction if you take it and go out in the sun. So it, it's not always optimal for people in the summertime that, you know, have been bitten by a tick that are trying to go to the beach the next week. But um, obviously you don't want to mess around with, with Lyme. So if that's what you're given, you should take it, but definitely try to stay out of the sun. Um, normally, like I said before, doctors will give like a week, two weeks, maybe a month if the patient's lucky of the doxycycline and, and then they just, you know, call it good to go. But the problem with that is the antibodies are not even measurable for six weeks after someone gets bitten. So you won't even know um, if you have Lyme definitively for six weeks. And by that point, you know, you have Lyme normally. So it's, it's better just not to mess around with it and do the doxycycline. Uh, they do have um, vaccines now, which we'll go over in the prevention section, but I just wanted to mention that a couple of times. Uh, clarithromycin and ceftin are, and tetracycline are kind of, uh, you know, first, second, or second, third, and fourth line therapies. Uh, ceftin can be a little aggressive, um, you know, as far as like messing with joints and, and tearing up the gut. I typically give people Saccharomyces boulardii, uh, which is a, a protective type of probiotic that serves as a placeholder for the good bacteria when they're on doxy so that you're not causing something like SIBO, which is another thing that I forgot to mention in here is it's kind of um, pretty prevalent in Lyme patients as well, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Tinidazole um, is, although it's a, I put it in the conventional treatment approaches section, most regular doc, like medical doctors won't prescribe it um, because it's, it's just not been tested for Lyme, but it does have a property where it's a biofilm breaker. So the Lyme will actually like form little conglomerates and then they'll spin kind of like cocoons around themselves to protect um, the those organisms from being killed off by the immune system and by um, medicines. And the tinidazole will actually help to break that open. So a lot of times I'll give tinidazole and oxycycline at the same time, even if I'm not sure if a patient has Lyme because it's, they can quickly do that. And it's good to get ahead of it and make sure that you break open those biofilms and kill everything that you can, because otherwise they'll hide in joint spaces and they can hide in organ systems and muscle tissues and, and then, you know, areas in the neck. Um, and they can really, uh, like be very stealthy and, and just lay dormant and then proliferate later. Um, once, you know, the, the host or the person is a little bit weaker. Um, rifampin and azithromycin is what people will typically take for Bartonella. Um, some other options would be like methylene blue, Cipro, and Clotrimazole. And then for Babesia, uh, Tovaquone and uh, azithromycin, clindamycin, and quinine for um, Babesia. Some people, and if it's a really bad infection, they'll actually take um, hydroxychloroquine and um, methotrexate, but I don't think that's usually necessary. So here I couldn't figure out how to get the, uh, the pre-programmed, um, words in there. So I just <laughs> scribbled it out. So forgive the weird artwork there. Um, 
some alternative and integrative treatment approaches would include herbal therapies, homeopathic remedies, like I said, biofilm busters. So getting rid of those co cocoons, um, addressing like the underlying health issues. The most of your immune system is housed in your gut. So if there's any GI issues, whether it's food allergies or you know, celiac or other infections like bacterial infections, parasitic infections, candida, any of those, you want to address them because that's going to prevent the immune system from functioning optimally and then fully eradicating um, the Lyme. So like I said, Lyme can cause allergies. It can also exacerbate existing allergies that may have been kind of surface level or subclinical. Um, it can, you want to infect, uh, do the other infections as well, because again, they're going to distract your immune system from its bigger job, which is the Lyme. And that's what the Lyme wants. Um, diet and lifestyle changes. Obviously, if you are not the healthiest person and then you have, you know, an additional burden on your body, uh, you're not going to feel great if you've got your body has too many things to contend with. So a lot of people, once they get Lyme, it's, they kind of think of it as a blessing in disguise because it makes them have to overhaul their entire life and they feel better than they felt before they ever got Lyme. But, you know, that's it when you do the work. Some IV therapies, um, I use Rocephin IVs for neurological Lyme specifically, and also the alpha lipoic acid um, alternated with it. Vitamin C can also help. Um, it also is kind of a blanket, you know, immune system booster. So it, it treats a lot of these other things as well as the Lyme. Um, hydrogen peroxide can also help. And then ozone, um, where you take a little, take blood out and then you flash it with ozone and then you give it back, kind of cleans out the blood a little bit. Um, adjunctive therapies, ART is autonomic response testing, where, you know, you, it's like a muscle testing technique where you try to figure out exactly what the biggest issue is and kind of work down from there and then what your body would be responsive to or what it would tolerate. Because a lot of people, like I said, that have Lyme will develop severe sensitivities and then either multiple chemical sensitivities or electromagnetic frequency issues or, you know, the mycotoxins will kind of tweak out their body a little bit. So the ART can help prioritize um, HBOT, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. That's, uh, we used to have that at NIA. I don't know if we have it anymore. I don't think so. We took, got rid of it during COVID, but, um, that is really great for helping to regenerate, um, cellular function, um, create ATP or cellular energy, and then, you know, just help the body to fight Lyme in general. And then there's peptide therapy where, um, they actually can isolate, you know, specific proteins to help with Lyme directly and, and some of the co-infections. Um, homeopathic remedies are usually it's no sodes that you would use. You could use constitutional remedies or the little pellets as well, but, um, the Lyme no sodes are just really easy because they have the energetic imprint of Lyme on it. So it kind of primes your immune system to recognize it and get rid of it. Um, drainage remedies, a lot of times when you have a lot of biotoxins in your body, um, your lymphatic fluid tends to get backed up and that can cause even more symptoms than the actual bacteria itself. So it helps to, you know, do manual lymphatic massage on your lymph nodes and in your lymph system, and then use these drainage remedies. And then Desbio is a company that has, um, no sodes specific for different co-infections. They have mycoplasma, they have Bartonella, they have Candida, they have Lyme, they have um, the B. Did I say Babesia? I don't remember, but you get the gist. Um, some of the herbal therapies, I love to use artemisinin because it's super easy. Oops. Um, and it doesn't taste great even in pill form, but it's, it's very effective um, and it can help with Bartonella as well. Um, Japanese knotweed is great for uh, Babesia and Bartonella and Lyme. Um, Cryptolepis, I like to use for Lyme and Babesia the most. Um, teasel root, I keep doing that. Um, teasel root's another one that's really great for Lyme. The Buner herbs are, they have, there's a whole protocol. There's some drain remedies in there. There's, um, I my favorites are Cemento and Banderol, which is basically like cat's claw um, for Cemento and Banderol. And then the Byron white herbs are formulations that um, have a combination of very potent herbs for Lyme. And they have a bab, they, 
they have uh they call them a something for Byron White herbs, but they have ABAB, a Bart, Lyme. Um, and those are very potent. So people who are very sick, you want to get start with maybe one or two drops, um, because that can actually cause a Herx reaction. Herx reaction is a die-off reaction that is basically like you're agitating whatever you know microbe you're trying to kill. And so it's emitting these biotoxins that are kind of like little chemical poisons in your body. And it, it makes you feel sicker, but they're doing that to keep you from doing what you're doing at the time, which is killing them. So you stop because you don't feel great. But a lot of times if people push through for a week or two, um, provided that it's not an allergic response, um, they, they will find that, that they'll get better. And there are some things to offset Herx reactions as well. You could do Epsom salt soaks. Um, I like chlorella and ultra binder, which has activated charcoals. You like clay, aloe, um, and then I think bentonite clay. There's just there's a lot of binders that you can take that will help mitigate some of that Herx reaction. Um, and then oregano is a potent killer for Bartonella as well. So, so biofilm busters that are not tenetazole would be serapeptase and cystisinchanus. There are more out there, but these are my favorites. So <clears throat> prognosis and outcomes. Um, I think I mentioned this before, the immediate prophylactic treatment can lead to a full resolution, but the length of the treatment varies per case. So some people will have absolutely no symptoms. And so how, you wonder, how do you know how to treat them? You know, but... I think that I kind of go by what level of exposure they had, where they were, uh, how big they are, um, how sick are they in general, or how, you know, not healthy, in perfect health they are. Um, and, you know, whether or not they had a rash. And because that, that actually is a hallmark of Lyme, but it also indicates that they have a very strong immune system function. So they may not need, you know, a full three months of treatment or two months of treatment, but the testing doesn't show infection for six weeks until after you're bitten. So it's better to treat just in case. Um, and then a lot of times what I'll do is have people, um, treat prophylactically with doxycycline, and then we'll do an herbal protocol just to be sure that's a little more just immune system boosting. So even if they don't have Lyme, it's still beneficial. Um, Lyme that's not treated can easily become chronic Lyme and full resolution is unlikely even with treatment. But if you may, if you maintain it, so like every six months or every time, you know, something else happens, you treat the Lyme and just consider it like a virus almost, um, you can keep it at bay and you basically are symptom free. So it's in remission. Um, you have to identify other systemic weaknesses too. And then, you know, people generally feel better than they did before they ever got Lyme afterward. Um, so here's some prevention and natural tick repellents. Terra Shield by doTERRA is a good one. Ger geranium oil is supposed to be the best for, uh, repelling ticks. Um, mosquitoes, since I said those could transmit Lyme and some of these other co-infections as well. Uh, the best ones for that are citronella, lemongrass, eucalyptus, lavender, peppermint, rosemary, and tea tree oil. And there are companies I'm sure that make combinations of this. And I actually, um, have a slide next that'll show you where you can get, uh, I have a protocol that you can use. Wearing long pants and long sleeves while hiking or being in um, what my son calls the tick grass, you know, long grass um, can protect you from you know, them attaching. Uh, check for ticks if you live in an area that was recently deforested. Um, I actually, my daughter was, had a, a tick that attached to her in the, in like downtown DC um, playing on a playground. So it's, you know, because it was near the woods and, and new developments were recently being done. So that's, that's possible. Um, if you apply a comfrey salve alternated with bentonite clay or just the comfrey salve in general, um, to the side of the bite, it helps to draw out the infection so that, you know, if it does latch, it, it can at least help to, you know, keep it so that it's, it doesn't spread too quickly. And then you can take astragalus up to three times a day for two weeks if you don't want to do doxycycline. So that's an option. Um, and then they also make uh, Lyme vaccines. They actually started making Lyme vaccines 20 years ago, but it was just so underutilized that the company pulled it off the shelf. And now they're, they're making, uh, now that it's 
chronic Lyme is being taken seriously instead of being poo-pooed by the mainstream medical community, it's uh, gotten some popularity. So more companies are making them. I'm a little iffy on vaccines just because, you know, it can cause um, some immune system upregulation. And that's not great for people that have autoimmune conditions in general. But at the same time, it's kind of a double-edged sword because Lyme can really um, exacerbate autoimmune conditions. There, the Lyme um, vaccine that was on the market like 20 years ago, there was a lawsuit uh, that said that it caused arthritic symptoms in people. Um, but that might have just been you know, exacerbation of existing Lyme or another autoimmune condition. Who knows? The jury is still out, I guess. Um, if you want to find the Lyme protocols and products, this is my uh, full script store where I put, you know, each, like there's a people who have Lyme and then a prevention, you know, early Lyme protocol. So they're both in there. And then desbio.com, they're the ones that I told you about had the uh, homeopathics for the co-infections in Lyme, Byron White Herbs, you can just Google that and it should come up. And then um, I believe at NIA they carry Research Nutritionals, which has a really good protocol for um, a lot of different Lyme support. And here's some references. And do you guys have any questions? You can just feel free, free, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question, or you can even type it in the chat as well. So where's the chat? We've got a few minutes. Um, what are herbal treatment options for anaplasmosis? So um, anaplasmosis, I usually use kind of the same things that I would use to treat Lyme. You can use andrographis. You can use, um, uh, sorry, cryptolepis. You could use um, cat's claw. Japanese knotweed is great for it. Um, there, I mean, pretty much anything that kills Lyme will kill anaplasmosis. And somebody asked me to put the um, slide up with the store on it. So I will do that. Let me share my screen again. Come back to the questions in just a second. Run. All right, um, go back to Zoom. I can. <laughs> so, guys. I am apparently technologically inept. Hold on one second. Um, so I think we're just trying. We're just trying to get this link to the full script. Is that right? What's that? I, I can see the link here for the full script that we are pulling. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Actually, you know what? I'll just paste this in. Oops. I'll just paste this into. Um, the chat box so I can go back to the screen. So I don't know how to do both. So don't ask me to fix anybody's computer. <laughs> <laughs> um all right, where how do I get back to the chat? So you know? on the bottom if you click more there should be chat on the bottom right. Ah okay. There we go. And then let's see, long-term Lyme disease. Is long-term Lyme disease harder to treat? Um, I guess it depends. Uh, like I said, I think, you know, once it's been there a long time, it's really hard to completely eradicate because 
it's gotten into joint spaces. It's gotten into different parts of the body, um, but it can be done. Uh, I, I just usually consider it more of like a remission kind of thing versus like full cure. But I do have some patients that have told me that I've cured their Lyme disease. So I, you know, they don't have any issues with it anymore and haven't for a long time. So I get, I guess theoretically, yes. Um, So with the chronic Lyme thing, a lot of times you have to treat all of the things that are wrong in the body in order for you to feel, you know, hundred percent again. So it, it might be like when I, I actually had Lyme when I was pregnant, um, I went hiking and didn't realize that my dog had gotten a tick and it ended up jumping on me. I didn't realize it. It wasn't latched for very long, but the pregnancy, that pregnancy was extremely hard um, because, you know, and I was managing the Lyme, I guess, pretty well. And then it wasn't until I got pregnant that all of a sudden I developed sciatica, I developed, you know, basically all the inflammation that you can possibly get um, from pregnancy. It was just completely exacerbated. And it wasn't until after I had the baby, I still felt horrible. It wasn't until I figured out that I had Lyme and I started treating that, um, that I felt normal again. Um, but the next time I had a preg I was pregnant, I was totally fine. And I went back to work like two weeks after and, um, you know, it's just, I could exercise. It was just totally different pregnancy. And I think it's, it was the line that made the first one hard. Um, can Lyme disease cause neurological problems similar to multiple sclerosis? Yes. I actually, most of my MS patients, I end up finding Lyme titers in, um, and no, a lot of times when somebody, when you treat that line, the multiple sclerosis, like the antibodies and um, the symptoms go away. So another thing too, is a lot of times Lyme is misdiagnosed as multiple sclerosis, because when you do an MRI, um, it'll show like white matter lesions kind of similar to, or very similar to multiple sclerosis. And so they call it that, and they don't have any of the other symptoms of multiple sclerosis, but they have fatigue, joint pain, um, headaches, you know, all of the Lyme gamut. And, um, you know, when they come and they want me to treat them for multiple sclerosis, I end up treating them for Lyme and then they feel better. So yes, absolutely. Any how long does it take most ticks to transmit Lyme once they are attached? Um, it's kind of hard to say. It depends on how loaded down with the bacteria they are, um, how much blood is regurgitated, you know, is, is so basically what happens when they stick their proboscis in, stick their little nose, um, they, they will take out some of your blood and then some of their blood goes into um yours into your body and so depending on how much content of bacteria is in that blood you know at the time it it can transmit pretty quickly like within 15 to 30 minutes or you know sometimes it can take a few hours um even maybe a day but it just it really depends i would say normally like as soon as you get a tick bite even if you get them off right away, I, I would do some kind of prophylactic treatment like the comfrey salve and, and the stragulus at least. Any other questions? Jill, you can unmute yourself if you have a question. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Uh-huh. Well, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. And I do have a quick question. I have, um, I was actually treated at NIA. I have late stage Lyme disease with Bartonella and Babesia, and I have, you know, multiple systems. But what's most frustrating is the brain fog. Is there anything you can think of, like uh, supplements or anything that would help with that? Um. Yes, I I like to use CDP choline. Okay. And um. You, there's a formula that's called neurologics and that has CDP choline um, along with other things. Um, and a lot of times I find that the patients that have persistent brain fog, cause that's one of the harder ones to get rid of um, it's allergy related. So you might want to look at, you know, identifying in hormones, 
look at your hormones, look at um, food allergies and environmental allergies too. Okay. Thank you so much for your help. No problem. Anybody else? We're almost out of time, but I'll take another question if anyone has one. No. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate uh, you listening, and hopefully that was, you know, some good information for you. And I'll try to expand upon that in future talks. <laughs>